that it takes on. And uh, more this, the Vitruvian hating, which we were talking about last week. Now, I think, uh, whilst it's probably good enough for the laity to say of a thing, I like it, or I don't like it, and leave it just as an emotional experience of that sort, or expression of an emotional experience. I don't think it's quite good enough, is it, for the people who are going to dedicate their lives to producing artifacts. I think if they have some means even of assessing their own work as they go along, it's probably help. And in not that context, perhaps it's a bit, a bit of heresy that if you find a jury contemplating the work over which you have sweated a great deal of blood and merely saying, I don't like it, then I think you have grounds for some pain. Juries ought to be a little bit more, I think, uh, shall we say, capable of appraising work than that. They're not always you'll find, but if they're not, you should complain, you see. Now, it's a question of reaction, isn't it? The, the emotive side of it. And in this appraisal, one knows from long experience that the worst bit that gets done is the um, judgment or the description of the actual appearance of the pot in terms of its design quality. It's easy enough to get hold of the function. Uh, perhaps a little more difficult to get hold of the notion that materials should be used in a way which does not flout their integrity. Now, that is quite important, I think, when you come to commercially produce things of this sort, most people here, I think, will know the pottery process. How many people have actually grown a pot in school, say? Not everyone, by any means. Well, you know, uh, the potter gets the malleable clay, throws it onto the wheel, and uh, using his hands or her hands, brings the pot up to shape. That's a sophisticated way of making pots. The old ancient way was simply to coil the rather dry clay round and round, uh, gudging it together with wet clay and smoothing it off inside and out. That's how the enormous oil jars of the ancient world were made. They were coiled, you see. Uh, for the commercial pottery, it is not possible to employ a potter to throw every pot. For one thing, they are selling them from catalogues, so everything's got to be the same. So what they do, if it is possible to, to um, <coughs> do it on the wheel, they make a jig from the original made by the skilled potter. And the jig is used to um, shake the pot, and then it's smoothed off. But more commonly, that would be the case, I think, with superior pottery of this kind. This is a, a wedge wood going back to their 18th century design, as a matter of fact, the very first pots they made. Teapots, after all, date from the late 17th century, you see. And when people could afford it, they liked them made in metal. But I'm jumping ahead a little bit. This kind of pot, yes, probably mechanically turned on a wheel. But um, the cheaper sort of pot, if you look, you can almost see the seams. Yes, I can see them just about here. Yes. Made of two halves. It's <coughs> castings from the original, turned on a wheel. You get the idea? They make a casting and they put the two bits together, hole is left for the spout that goes on 
has a casting, the handles are casting, and so you get the complete pot. But if you get consumers who rather wish that they could have afforded, as clearly someone did long ago, uh, this is a luster pot simulating silver, you see, uh, wish that they could have had a pot made of metal, then this is not really a pottery shape at all, is it? It's a, it's a metal shape. It does not really respect the material. It's possible to make it because it's made um, out of a sheet of clay, you see? Uh, presumably rolled out, uh, put together, bottom stuck on, and the other two bits. So those are the basic things about production. And I think those have to be taken into consideration when you're actually looking at the pots. There are not many examples here of a kind of decoration. Uh, this is an example. This is a Wedgwood pot, a small pot. Uh, it's the decoration is an integral glaze known as slip. You can see here how, it, how it's done in this half plate, which no doubt will work its way around the room gradually. Two different colour glazes, one on top of the other. The slipware, but that's fairly rare. The most common, as to the material, uh, the most common is very little better ground a bit finer, uh, very little better than the earthenware used for flower pots. And your British standard teapot is earthenware. Mr. Wedgwood, towards the middle of the 18th century, developed a new kind of earthenware, mixed with china clay, ground very fine, and he called it uh, creamware, and there it is. It takes a much finer finish uh, and costs an awful lot more. But I suppose the uh, pophagy, the tops of the teapot or the pottery world, uh, is the stuff known as bone china, which is a mixture of china clay, which is decayed granite. This is uh, bone china mixed with felspar and originally with ground up bones. But as the ground up bones now mostly go to the beef burgers, they're probably a short supply. <laughs> um, but you can see the difference, I think. Nearly all of these things are earthenware, either common or superior. There are one or two in bone china, but not very many. Then, uh, you have to make up your mind, I think, about uh, functional efficiency. We have a sheet for you to save time. Functional efficiency, uh, one of the headings here. Quality of finish. Has there been a lot of dust around in the, in the factory, in the pottery, and has the dust settled in the glaze? Very often it has. Uh, acceptable up to a point, certain percentage in these, these pots. These now range in price. The common English Staffordshire pot ranges in price now on lunchtime uh, observation of a rapid kind from about um, six pounds of that to probably ten or 11 for that. Uh, these from the Wedgwood lists, this range, Black Lugano has now been withdrawn some six or seven years ago. This probably something in the nature of 36 pounds. This sort of um, rather glitzy sort of landlady pot, um, probably about 15. And uh, yes, this sort of thing you would find for between 12 and 15 in any shop. Then there are figurative, shall we say, teapots. I haven't got very many, 
I used to borrow someone whose mother had left her a lettuce, a teapot in the form of a lettuce. And stupidly, she's thrown it away. But this was given me by a couple of Norwegian students about 14 years ago. And it's a rather good um, 1930s sports car, complete with leather helmeted uh, driver. The wheels don't go round. This is now used to be rare, but you can now see it in almost any shop. The cottage teapot. And if you look in that Widard shop in the um, Westgate Arcade, uh, you will see a whole variety of pots of that genre, which aesthetically are a bit difficult to place. Architecturally, you can find the equivalent of this on the outskirts of many American cities, of course. The diner in the shape of a hamburger, you know? <laughs> or the house in the form of a ladybird. That sort of thing. Uh, not <laughs> now, size, size is not a criteria. Can I make that clear? Size, no criterion. Because teapots are sold, well, this, is, this does take one cup of tea. And clearly, from the way it's, the, 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 um, the finish has gone, it, someone must have used it for a long time. It holds one cup. But normally, teapots start from, in the trade, uh, a two-cup pot, a two-cup pot up to, I haven't got the biggest one, I think it's got broken, uh, the, up to about a ten-cup. So. Don't judge it according to size, you see. I mean, this, this I think, would be an exception, possibly. Now, as far as possible, we would like you to make an appraisal of a common or garden teapot and of a somewhat superior one. This is, uh, <coughs> so, well, I mustn't make any judgment, must I? One, two, three, four, five, there are six fairly cheapo pots here, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight rows. Uh, I think it'd be best, Baron, if people work in groups of three. Mm -hmm. Don't you think so? So those two isolated gentlemen over there, if they wouldn't mind joining, make a group of, with someone else, a group of three, please. Yes? Otherwise, there won't be enough pots to go around and you'll be frustrated as you wait for them. So, uh, there's water here, so you can see um, whether they pour reasonably. And the other thing, I think that one won't go around, Byron, is it? This, if you want to examine this one afterwards, people tend to pull the safety valve off. Tea is obviously a very dangerous and explosive substance. <laughs> this pot has got a safety valve. <laughs> In the call, it's called the, uh, the Patent Anti-Tannic Tea Infuser by Marshalls. It was produced in the 1880s when, believe it or not, there was a scare to the effect that tea, because it was a tannin, gave people cancer. So there's a sort of special thing here so that uh, you didn't, I think you must have got some lousy tea out of it, but because um, uh, we've got this infusion in it, steam, I suppose, could be trapped in there, so the whole thing, they thought, might explode. Yeah, see, I'm sure you don't heat that up on the bottom, do you? And you can lock it, look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, well, 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 let's see. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you.